Hello, my name is Dr. Don Buford. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and the founder and director of the Dallas PRP and Stem Cell Institute. The title of this presentation is What About Stem Cells in Orthopedics? A presentation recently given at the 38th Annual Cherry Blossom Seminar. These are my disclosures and my social media contacts. So I want to first define the talk. We are talking about mesenchymal stem cells or as alternatively known medicinal signaling cells. MSCs are multipotent adult stem cells. Cell differentiation is limited to the mesodermal layer, which is the layer that gives rise to bone, muscle, cartilage, tendon, ligament, adipose, and connective tissues. The term mesenchymal stem cell was coined by Arnold Kaplan, PhD, over 25 years ago. Because of the term's misuse, since about 2017, Dr. Kaplan has wanted to change the name to medicinal signaling cells. MSCs are pericytes. They are located in all vascular tissues. Upon activation or injection or implantation in a specific location, they can activate and release many different trophic factors, immunomodulatory factors, and antimicrobial factors. What we see here is a graphic demonstrating the regenerative medicine tissue healing cascade. We can see many things involved in regenerative techniques that are active at different phases in the tissue healing cascade. Platelets, neutrophils, granulocytes, and macrophages are all active early uh, post-injury in the first five to 10 days. We can see that after the initial inflammatory phase, there is a longer proliferation phase that lasts from four to 30 days. It is during this proliferation phase that we see the rise in hematopoietic stem cells, uh, the rise in new vascularity, uh, the rise in fibroblastic activity, and um, uh, the beginnings of the increase in tissue strength. The longer lasting remodeling phase that starts at about 21 days post injury and goes on for years or more uh, is, is demonstrated on the right side of the graphic. So let's get to some common questions because we have to debunk some myths before we get to where we are with the current state of science. Question number one, are there MSCs in commercially available per birth tissue products? By birth tissue products, I'm referring specifically to amniotic fluid, umbilical cord blood, placental tissues, and Wharton's jelly. The short answer is no. There are not MSCs that are functional or alive at the time of delivery in a doctor's office with these commercially sold products. I often get a comment from my colleagues that say, but Donnie, my rep told me that there were, and here you have to pick your number depending on the email or the ad, that there were two, four, six million, eight million, or 10 million MSCs per cc in this bottle. And additionally, I was told I can shock thaw them out in 15 minutes or less. Well, sadly, none of this is true. There's been several recent publications from very well-known institutions and researchers showing that these claims are simply not true. Uh, back at the 2015 Interventional Orthopedic Foundation meeting, there is a very well done poster presentation uh, done by Dustin Berger, Nicolette Lyons, and Nevin Steinmetz. They examined multiple amniotic products and they found no living functional stem cells in these products. And the link is given at the bottom of this slide. Here we see a publication from this year, 2019, co-authored by Lisa Fortier, a well-known orthobiologic researcher and veterinarian, and Dr. Brian Cole, a well-known orthopedic surgeon interested in orthobiologics. And this was presented at the Orthopedic Research Society annual meeting. Uh, their group tested nine Amnion products from four different manufacturers. And not only did they find no living stem cells in these products, they found very low growth factor levels. Uh, this is important because we're often uh, told as clinicians that these products can be an alternative source of growth factors uh, for, for doctors or for situations where patients um, need additional growth factors and autologous sources like platelet-rich plasma or bone marrow are not available. Uh, this has been shown to, to not be true now in multiple publications. Uh, here's a link at the bottom to Dr. Fortier's interview regarding her uh, recent publication and you can see an abstract listed on the bottom right. This is another recent 2019 publication authored by Alberto Pinero, uh, Dr. Alan Hirahara, and Wyatt Anderson. 
Uh, this was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine and they tested multiple amniotic fluid products again. Uh, they invited seven companies and only three companies sent product. Four companies declined testing. What they found was that these products did not have stem cells. It was also very important that they tested fresh amniotic fluid and they even found that fresh amniotic fluid did not contain significant stem cells as defined uh, by current international standards. At the same time as a control they tested bone marrow aspirate and they did find that bone marrow aspirate did have living functional stem cells that could grow in culture and meet all of the other criteria. In 2019 there was a consensus statement co-authored by multiple uh, researchers in a multidisciplinary approach. Um, you can see the list of uh, initial signers on the left of this slide. Uh, the ultimate um, consensus statement is two pages long but the final conclusion is listed here in yellow. The aggressive marketing approach currently used by practitioners and clinics regarding various birth tissue products as safe and effective stem cell therapy is just not supported by the existing scientific literature. So please let's all stop that, let's stop selling it and making those claims and let's stop using it and telling patients that these birth tissue products have living functional stem cells after we thaw them out in the office. So where do we really have science for use of stem cells in orthopedics? Here's an example showing the currently published levels of evidence for multiple orthopedic conditions where we use autologous stem cells, primarily from bone marrow in this example. We have high level evidence uh, using bone marrow concentrate for knee osteonecrosis, for rotator cuff repair, and for hip osteonecrosis. We have medium level evidence around knee osteoarthritis, knee cartilage lesions, and lumbar degenerative disc disease. Uh, at the current time we have insufficient evidence for using bone marrow concentrate for rotator cuff tendinopathy, elbow tendinopathy, meniscal repair, uh, and ACL tears. And we have no significant evidence of efficacy uh, for anything else that's not on this list to my knowledge. Here's an example of a study that was published in 2018. And this is a study that was titled Subchondral Stem Cell Therapy versus Contralateral Total Knee Arthroplasty for Osteoarthritis Following Secondary Osteonecrosis of the Knee. Uh, this was a very interesting, uh, groundbreaking study with a very long follow-up uh, published by the lead author Philippe Hernigal, who's an orthopedic surgeon based in Paris, France. Uh, in this particular study, there were 30 uh, patients. The average age was 28. And these patients all had uh, just horrible secondary knee osteonecrosis uh, from steroid use. And so here you can see a typical uh, x-ray and MRI scan um, in the before pictures. Uh, what Dr. Hernigau did in this trial was he did a total knee replacement in one knee and at the same time on the opposite knee he did a bone marrow concentrate procedure instead of a total knee replacement. Uh, the data on the bone marrow concentrate procedure are uh, as noted here, 6,500 CFUs per milliliter were delivered. Uh, 10 cc's of bone marrow concentrate was delivered to the medial and lateral femoral condyle, and 10 cc's was also delivered respectively to the medial and lateral tibial plateau, which meant that a total of 40 cc's of bone marrow concentrate was delivered. Dr. Hernigo followed these patients for 12 years, and at the end of 12 years, the outcome scores were the same whether the knee had had an orthobiologic treatment with bone marrow concentrate or a total knee replacement. When the patients were polled directly, 70% preferred the knee that had the bone marrow concentrate orthobiologic injections. In addition, there were multiple complications in the surgical group that were not present in the group that just had a single injection of bone marrow concentrate on the day of surgery. 20% of the total knee replacement group required revisions over the course of the 12 years of follow-up and there were multiple other medical and surgical complications noted in the group that had knee replacement. Things such as blood clotting uh, were reported. This is another great study published by Dr. Hernigau in 2018 in the International Orthopedics Journal and it shows the superiority of bone marrow concentrate injections over cordy compression for patients that have hip osteonecrosis. So here's a cohort of 125 patients. They have bilateral hip osteonecrosis. Uh, Dr. Hernigal purposely stacked the deck against the bone marrow concentrate treatment side by using the larger lesion uh, as the side to be treated with bone marrow concentrate. The smaller lesion was treated with a core decompression, which is considered standard of care um, at this time. 30 years later, the bone marrow cellular therapy side won. 
And what I mean by that is that only 28% of the hips that had the bone marrow concentrate injection had further collapsed versus 72% of the hips that had the standard core decompression. In addition, only 24% of the hips that had the bone marrow concentrate injection had gone on to total hip replacement 30 years later versus 76% of the hips that had core decompression. So there was significant superiority shown, and this was statistically significant, uh, shown for, for the, uh, the group that had the bone marrow concentrate injection. Once again, Dr. Hernigo published an international orthopedics uh, uh, report on treating rotator cuff tears with bone marrow concentrate. And this was a cohort group with 45 patients in each group. One group was treated with bone marrow concentrate at the time of surgery, and the other group was treated without bone marrow concentrate. And these were medium to large rotator cuff tears, averaging 1.4 to 2.5 centimeters. Uh, Dr. Hernigo aspirated 150 cc's of bone marrow from the iliac crest, and in his quantification of the procedure, the average number of MSCs delivered was 51,000 MSCs. He divided that and put two-thirds of that into the greater tuberosity in a subchondral or um, subcortical location, and four cc's of the bone marrow concentrate was injected at the tendon bone repair site. The follow-up period was 10 years long, and at six months, he noted that 100% of the rotator cuff repairs were healed in the bone marrow concentrate group versus 67% in the control group. At the 10-year follow-up mark, 87% of the repairs were still intact in the group that were augmented with bone marrow concentrate. This was more than a double or, or nearly double the number that were intact at 10 years in the group that did not have bone marrow concentrate augmentation. The single most important variable that Dr. Hernigau discovered in this study was the number of MSCs that were delivered. Here's a 2014 study uh, published by Dr. Kim and others. Uh, the title of the study is The Clinical Outcome of Autologous Bone Marrow Aspirate Injection in Degenerative Arthritis of the Knee. This is a relatively large study with 75 knees treated with a single intraarticular bone marrow concentrate injection. Average age was 60. You can see the spread in the uh, grade of arthritis in the knees. Most knees were in the middle grades of KL2 or 3. These patients reported a 50% pain reduction at one year and an increase in their IKDC outcome measures from 38 to 66. So here we have a statistically significant decrease in pain and increase in function from a single intraarticular injection of bone marrow concentrate. Here's a 2015 study. Uh, the lead author is Kristen Oliver, and the title is Clinical Outcome of Bone Marrow Concentrate in Knee Osteoarthritis. Again, a relatively large study with 70 knees treated with a single injection of bone marrow concentrate. 54% uh, of the knees were either uh, KL2 or KL3, and one-third of the knees approximately were KL4, more significant arthritic changes. Uh, she used the Arthrex Angel to make bone marrow concentrate. Uh, she noted that all Coos knee outcome scores were improved. Uh, most patients had data out to six months, which admittedly is a relatively short follow-up time, but she did have 11 patients in the study with data out to one year, and she reported no significant drop-off in outcome measures in those 11 patients either. Uh, this is a 2014 study in the Biomedical Research International Journal. Uh, the lead author is Christopher Centino. Uh, he published this along with John Pitts and, and some other colleagues. Uh, in this study, 616 knees were treated with a mixture of bone marrow concentrate, platelet-rich plasma, and platelet lysate. Uh, the follow-up averaged 17 months, and what they noted was that the lower extremity functional scores increased uh, by 8, and that the pain scores reported by patients dropped uh, nearly in half. So here's a large study. Uh, it's not a single orthobiologic study, so it's hard to have a single conclusion about bone marrow concentrate, but it is additional evidence that in a large number of patients, we can go nearly a year and a half with significant decrease in pain and increase in function with a single intraarticular injection. Now here's a 2018 study. Uh, this is a follow-up study published by Kristen Oliver. Uh, this was published in the Journal of Arthroplasty. Uh, we now have 254 knees that she's treated with bone marrow concentrate. Uh, the average follow-up is now two years. And what she noted in this study was that the Womack functional outcomes increased by 8, and that these patients' pain scores dropped from an average of 4.8 to 
so 50% reduction in pain that was durable out to two years. So additional evidence that a single intraarticular injection of bone marrow concentrate can have some clinical efficacy for knee osteoarthritis. What about the hip? Well, here's a study published by uh, Centino and Pitts and, and uh, their colleagues. And this is published in Stem Cell Research and Therapy in 2014. In this study, 216 hips were treated with a combination of BMC, PRP, and platelet lysate. The average follow-up is nine months. Uh, what they noted was a 30% improvement in the patient-reported SANE score, and they also reported functional outcome measures that improved. Uh, the Oxford hip score improved six points, and this was noted um, at follow-up that was just shy of a year. What about the lumbar disc, where there's multiple longitudinal studies looking at an injection of autologous bone marrow concentrate into the lumbar disc for discogenic pain. Uh, the authors on these studies are Ken Patin, Matthew Murphy, uh, Richard Suzuki, and Ted Sands. And what they noted in, in sequential uh, publications was that these patients had durable outcomes out to three years, and now there's been a follow-on study going out to five years showing that injecting the disc with autologous bone marrow concentrate can be a treatment that results in significant pain reduction and even MRI improvement in the uh, disc appearance. So some closing thoughts. Uh, stem cell therapy is based on established human biology. Uh, birth tissue stem cells as sold and delivered in the United States are scams. I would venture a guess that probably 75% of the patients in this country that have been uh, sold a stem cell therapy have not really had living functional stem cells injected. And I say that because of the incredible number of chiropractor clinics and non-musculoskeletal specialists delivering patients um, products that are frozen, shipped to the doctor's office, and thawed out in very quick fashion in a process almost certainly guaranteed to kill any cells if there were any uh, in those vials in the first place. So my recommendation to all of us is to use autograph sources of stem cells, either bone marrow or adipose. Uh, if uh, someone is still choosing adipose, we have to be cognizant of the FDA regulations, and we have to remember that in the United States, we aren't allowed to make stromal vascular fraction or to uh, culture cells um, because of FDA restrictions. Continuing to translate in vitro and animal results to humans will take time. So I encourage all of us that are interested in these treatments clinically to use registries and to record all the variables. Thank you very much for your time.